Yeah. Um, I, uh, I want to start with this. Uh, tonight we have a, um, a different show for you, and it's kind of a philosophical show a little bit. I'm working on some things in my head, and uh, I, I have to tell you that I, 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 I feel like I have been filling my body with poison for the last four years. Um, there's a, a Sufi saying, is that what you gaze upon you become. And I have tried so hard not to become that which I gaze upon. Last night at uh, two o'clock in the morning, I was, I was just reading some old, just some stuff that has happened in the past that is just horror shows. And I'm tired, tired of reading it. I'm tired of talking to you about it. I'm, uh, I'm tired, uh, quite honestly, um, of being the guy that uh, has to bring it to you. Um, it's poison. It's poison. And the answer isn't just to expose the poison. The answer really comes, I think, from this guy. It's not the poison of the problem. It is the connection of really where I started here, the 912 Project. It is the, um, the values and the principles that make us great. It is the, it is it is the reaching out of the slime and trying to grab for something higher. But it doesn't seem like that's what we're doing. I am very optimistic on the things that I have seen. The things that have happened recently are miracles. Would you have believed that, what, a year ago, 18 months ago, would you have believed your country could have changed in the good way as well as the bad, in the good way? as much as it has. Tremendous progress. Tremendous progress towards a stated goal of restoration. But this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. This is a picture that hangs on the wall right across my desk. I fill my body with so much poison in the images and the words and everything else that I see that I have taken everything out of my office and replaced it with just goodness and courage and things that I want to become. I didn't even know who this guy was. This is um, a book called Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. I've only read a few bits of it. I haven't, uh, I haven't read all of it yet. I haven't had time because I'm trying to study this guy. But I. I picked it up the other day because, coincidentally, the guy who wrote this book um, bumped into me the other day, actually bumped into one of my staff members. And my staff member came to me and said, you really have to talk to this guy. He said, I, I don't think, Glenn, you really, really understand. You guys are meant to talk to each other. And uh, I said, that I will, I will, I will. I'll get to that. I have to get to that. Because what this man did, this is a guy who was a Lutheran minister in Germany. And he was really one of the first guys to see it. And he was one of the first guys to say, hey, we can't do that to the Jews. Um, it was as soon as um, uh, the chancellor was named as Hitler, um, he stood up and he warned. And he said, look, we, we can't do this. We're changing. And the reason why he really warned is because God was being lost. You have to understand, Germany was a very God-centered place, but it was kind of a, he talks later in life when he was in prison and they were torturing him, um, uh, he talked about, uh, we need a, I think he called it a, a churchless religion or something like that. And the, um, the left always tries to twist that into, see, he's a social justice guy. He's, no, he wasn't. What he meant by that was, in Germany, everything was so stiff and everything was by the book and by the rule. And all of the people that were behind the pulpit um, just said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't, uh, just just shh, don't make trouble. It's going to be okay. We'll just get past this. And he wouldn't shut up. He said, um, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. When my friend bumped into this guy, I said, I will, I will. I, I, I have to talk to him. I'll get to that. But I have to find somebody.
they can talk to me about Gandhi first. I have to study Gandhi. And he said, oh, now, now you really have to talk to somebody about Bonhoeffer. He said, because Bonhoeffer said, while he was in Germany the whole time, somebody's got to get me in front of Gandhi. I, I know Gandhi has the answer. Gandhi does have the answer. The answer is uh, love. The answer is, um, you know, even Jesus turned over the tables. And so did Gandhi. But he um, found a way to never hate. He found a way. And we have found a way in our nation. But I don't know, and I'd, let me ask the audience, do you feel something is happening to our country? This is a, uh, we're walking a tightrope. We're walking a tightrope. And look what we have done. You know, for a year they tried to set up people like you or like me as violent, as dangerous. Have you noticed that they don't make that case anymore? Why? Because we took that tool away from them. We took that tool away from them. You stood and you were who you were. You stood and you weren't angry and you weren't uh, dangerous and you weren't threatening people. And then 828 happened. They can no longer make that case that you're dangerous, hateful, or out of control. You just have to take the tools away one at a time and, and then uh, let them destroy themselves. Before we start, because uh, I want to just have a conversation with the audience here, and I, I, I want to have a one-on-one, -on -one, because honestly, um, I spent a lot of time in New York, and New York is a weird place. And uh, <laughs> it is a place that is... Uh, somebody said hi to me, and they said, this happened to me last night. Somebody said hi to me, and I'm walking down the street, and they're like, Glenn Beck. And I'm like, where? Hate that guy. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I said... Hey, he said, big fan. Here's the thing. He said it out loud, and he was a New Yorker. Usually it's this. <laughs> big fan. <laughs> um, things, are, uh, things are changing, and it's a good thing that, um, that they are. But sometimes sitting here in New York, I can, I can get a little lost, and um, I want to hear what you're concerned about about what you need. Um, what your neighbors are saying. What is it going to take to wake them up? How can we, met, how can we best make the case? Because this isn't about an election. It's not about an election. It's not about the president. It really is about three things here. Where did we come from? These are the, really the only three questions in life, I think. Where did we come from? Where are we going to end up? Where are we going? And what happens in between? And is the what happens in between related to where did we come from or where are we going? That's the real secret. What is the natural order of things? Is it this? Ronald, come here for a second. What is the natural order of things? Tyson, you come here for a second. My staff was paid handsomely today to put these all like this. Now for free, Ronald and Tyson. Just start to shake. You don't have to shake hard. Just keep, just keep shaking. Shake from the bottom. Shake from the bottom. And just keep shaking. Now, here's my question. You'll see that the order has changed. How long, how long, anyone, do these guys have to shake before that pattern comes back that we started in? How long? Forever. <laughs> Gabe? Forever. Forever. It will never go back to the order. Never. You can shake and shake and shake, and that pattern will never be repeated in nature. It won't. You can shake forever. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you, thanks guys, that tells you, and this I'm taking home, um, <laughs> that tells you that when you find order, something's afoot. 
And this really is, this is, this is life. This is what happens, this is what happens in life. Well, is your life what you planned it on being? It's not mine. Mine, is, mine isn't anything like I planned it on. My daughter said to me the other day, she said, Dad, my life never turns out the way it's supposed to. And I said, no. Life never turns out in a nice little neat pattern. Order and entropy. What is entropy? Entropy is this. Everything decays. Now, why am I telling you about this? And I doubt I'm ever going to get to the pineapple. Um, why am I telling you this? Because that's what's happened to our nation. Entropy. That's what happened to us. That's what's happened to our family. Entropy. It's natural. It's, it's spiritual gravity. It just, it just pulls you apart. It's honestly, it's why you don't want to see me with my shirt off. Because after a while, everything just goes. It just decays. That's what life is all about, really. It is the endurance of the decay. So, how does that, how does that relate? What happens when you decay? If, if you're living in a nation that needs order, and it just keeps decaying. Where do you get the order? You get the order from somebody. You usually end up begging somebody. Wait, I can't make sense of this. I don't know what this is. Th nothing is working. And then usually somebody will come in and they'll say, oh, I can make this work. Let me shake it for a while. Instead, what we need is not somebody to teach us how to do that. We need to figure out what the order is supposed to look like. And then it, if it requires us to take and dump it all out and start all over again, well then, that's what we need to do. But no matter what you do, no matter how you shake it, no matter who's in charge, unless they take everything out and they look for the pattern and say, okay, this was the pattern you're never going to get it back. It's going to decay. Even if we go into socialism, which will transform us, and that's what's happening, even if we go into a new global order, it is a lower order than freedom. It is a lower order than a republic. So that will decay as well, and that's why socialism always ends poorly. And that's putting it mildly. It always ends poorly because it will decay as well, and then you need a, another nudge. Does it, can anybody explain why I, I think that we should stop concentrating on our rights? Everybody is concentrating on our rights. Does anybody have any thoughts on why we shouldn't concentrate on our rights? Is, are there, is, there, any, is there anybody who's Jewish here? You are, Ronald? Uh, and Samara? Yeah. Samara. Um, can you tell me in the Torah, how many times is the word rights used? 80,000 words. How many times is the word rights used? I can't tell you that. I don't know. Don't know? 